like uh, the speakers you learn it from, <laughs> if that's where you go. <laughs> it's it, yeah, it's not easy. I mean, I write uh, in writing about it. I've written about it in you, one of the papers has to do with uh, <coughs> academic EUs um, is identity and ego ego permeability, which is all about that. Mm -hmm. So I can say that the most important things in learning languages is you have to find your motivation in learning that, mm. right? Mm. If you're interested in learning languages, means that you got to find your own way how to learn that. Because self-study is better than just yeah. like, uh, well, you can listen to other people's opinion or other people's experience about how, how do they learn any language. But it's not helping you much. Mm, mm, mm. What helps you a lot is find a way by yourself. That's what I think. And mm. uh, studying these languages means you are studying culture as well. So mm. it's got to be more interesting. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. 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 yeah my motivation is both cultural and uh, yeah, linguistic. Things. Because basi basically, basically, you know, getting to know people, getting to know different ways of looking at the world. And okay, I have to admit, when I was young, getting to know uh, people of the opposite sex, <laughs> getting to know, uh, you know, meet, meeting uh, people my age, etc. Yeah, yeah. So, team, team is something like that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, uh, Thanks, let me ask you something. So you have this ability in speaking a lot of languages now. Uh, is there any advantages? I mean, yeah, it should be advantages, but what does this ability apply in your life? Instead okay, of, so so when people of, talk about advantages, let me let me let me address the monetary advantages. Okay, so. Um, Using the language itself to make money, for example, interpreter, translator, can be lucrative. It's a big challenge. I, I studied at the United Nations uh, in Geneva, and so back in the, from 19, 1997. So I got to know many interpreters and simultaneous translators. It's a very challenging job. Okay, so that's just one way you could use the language itself. You could teach it, okay, but often people teach their first language, their mother tongue, depending. Uh, like for, in the case of English, of course, there's a big demand. But for me, I realized uh, early on that um, I wanted to use the languages in profession, but not make it my profession I saw that if I studied business, I could find a job much easier and be much more flexible. So, um, I mean, my university study is 13 years long with, uh, with um, uh, so nine universities and three masters and a PhD. Okay, so it's a long story. <laughs> but in that process, I, for example, my, my first degree uh, from University of Florida, which in itself is is a combination of studying at other universities around the world, including Switzerland, Colombia, um, was international to two um, majors: international relations and business administration. Um, my next degree was in Slavic literature in, in Poland, and uh, my next degree was uh, Chinese literature in Japan, and the one following that was. Uh, international business, uh, like an MBA, and then my PhD is cross-cultural management. Um, so, though, so you see, I studied a lot of literature because I loved it, but I knew I could uh, find a job much easier knowing business, and and I, I worked at two major corporations. Um, the last one being GE General Electric, which I quit in nineteen. 91 and came back to Japan and been a professor for 30 years. Um, so, yeah, the one advantage. So, what advantages did that give me? Okay, first of all, 
Um, I would never have gotten that job at GE at such a high level if I didn't if if I didn't know Japanese well. Because when I was uh, in Japan working for the other company, which was a actually as part of my master's studies, it was like a sort of like an internship. It wasn't it was an internship, but I had a special case because I could already I was already fluent in Japanese, so I didn't have to go to university in Japan for a year. I'd already been to university in Japan, so I worked for a year uh, at a paper company, and uh, they treated me like an expat. My salary was an internship, but they gave me, uh, I lived in a $5,500 apartment and they told me to expense everything. everything oh my gosh. Everything. So, um, yeah. So they wouldn't have hired me, you know, if I didn't know Japanese well. And then <clears> he <throat> wouldn't have hired me if I didn't know Japanese well and, and had not called on so many Japanese customers, for example. So even, and, and when I did work for GE, I, I used many different languages too. Because we did, I went down to Mexico a number of times, um, and I was dealing with partners in Spain, uh, and then other countries in Europe, uh, besides Japanese. So uh, that's helped me a lot. Uh, the advantage other monetary, I have done translations. I um, about three years ago, um, I got asked by somebody. I put my name in. For this one company and um they asked me to to be part of the project and i did it and they soon found out that um when they had me correct others i showed them look this isn't correcting i'm having to change everything because either you had uh english somebody strong in english maybe a native who didn't know japanese well enough or you had japanese who didn't know english well enough to make the final product you see it's not just understanding but to so understanding and then write it, the final product was English, we're going from Japanese. So the Japanese usually understood what was saying, you know, very well what was said, but they couldn't uh, always write a, the correct sentence in English. And then a lot of those who uh, were native English speakers uh, misunderstood what was being said in Japanese because they was, it was using a lot of kana terms, you know, uh, which, you know, loan words, and they didn't understand what it meant because they, they are, like we say, personal computers say pasacon. So they would say prakon. And nobody had an idea what prakon is. I investigated and figured out from the context it was a plastic conveyor belt <laughs> for plastic conveyor. And, and some people uh, found in dictionary it means plastic container. So in the, but it made no sense in the translation. <laughs> you know, see what I'm saying? So, okay. And I did once a, 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 a one from Serbian for. Um, five thousand dollars because they needed for a court testimony and i was the only one around who knew serbian um things like that you know so monetarily it's like it's been that way but put all that aside for me it's just been an in, 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 enriched life you know um because when you speak the language you, you you're accepted differently you know than the tourist going to some place like in nepal this is this picture behind me is unimportant nepal so mm. i speak nepali and uh, Tibetan Tamang Sherpa, which freaks them out. And so they're always, you know, especially <laughs> Tamang Sherpa. So I get warm welcomes and I understand the culture and I can travel cheaply. Like I've, I've been on treks for six weeks where I never paid for accommodation, even though I was staying at a place where normally you, and it usually only costs a few dollars anyway. But they said, no, just pay for your meals because, uh, you know, they knew I knew their situation and everything and so you know you get treated differently yeah i think that's a major benefit yeah. got, it. got it so don't you think that uh to be interpreter is kind of hard work because you know secrets yeah yeah <laughs> you know secrets like when there's a meeting between japanese and chinese or maybe japanese with i don't know the country they they were like talking uh, very exclusive things and you try to interpret their languages to their languages. There's, there must be secrets to go that one. Yeah, yeah, that's part of it. Yeah. yeah. For sure. So mm -hmm. it's kind of, you know, it's kind of hard, hard mm -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. So where, where do well you live? Well paid for that. Well paid, yeah. You get well paid though. Yeah. Where do you live? Or where you from? Strength? What do you say? <laughs> oh, I am Indonesian. 
I yeah. live in East Java. Yep. Where? East Java. Ah, uh, East Java. East Java. So, what's what town and what city? Malang. Ah, Malang. Okay. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I've been everywhere yeah. in Indonesia. Yeah, of oh, course. Oh, okay. So tell me about Malang. <laughs> tell you about Malang. Now, uh, if I'm correct, the Malang sits on the uh, east coast, halfway between uh, Jakarta and um, Yogyakarta. Yup. And um, yeah, uh, Malang. Malang, I'm not sure, you know, I'm, this is about uh, in that area about uh, 25 years ago, but I think in that area, I remember Sandy Beach, but with uh, some caves along the coast. I'm not sure if that was that area. A lot of beaches here. Yeah, there's beaches everywhere in Indonesia. <laughs> are you are you yeah, testing my yeah. memory or what? <laughs> no, no, no. It's twenty five years ago, so I it just I know, I know, I can understand. Yeah, yeah. Twenty five yeah, years yeah, ago. Yeah, well, Malang, Malang is hmm? educational uh, edu educational town. There are a lot of universities, schools, and. Oh, well, when, when I was there, I wasn't, I wasn't looking at the aspect. That travel was with my uh, wife and, and, and two young kids at that time. They were like age four and six, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, we were just, you know, enjoying things that kids enjoy at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, academically, I've only, you know, I've been to a conference in Georgia and Yeah, that's, that's and, what you were in other towns. We have yeah. we have Yogyakarta mm. in Central Java, but uh, to be honest, people know Malang as educational town, as mm. there are a lot of universities and schools here. People mm. uh, outside Malang come here just to study. Mm -hmm. That's what you. Find. Yep. Nice to meet you, though. Yeah. Thank you, Sain. Any other questions? Yeah, yeah. Tim, uh, I got a question. Uh, I, this question may may sound funny for some of you, but uh, I don't know if you have you ever tried this. I don't know if, if, if it's a dialect or it's a language. I think it's more like, like a dialect of this. Um, this I don't know if it's, if it's a town or I, I think there are nomads, but OK. I'm talking about these people from the south, the the, the Kalahari desert in, in Namibia. Oh yeah, the, yeah, yeah. The, the South Yeah, yeah, no. yeah, yeah. They, they are they they, they are called Boskimanos Boskimanos in in Spanish. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if he... yeah, they yeah, it's uh, the they they are the San people. Um, and uh, you know, after I I started I. Sorry, with Osa and then Zulu, which have you know also many clicks like they do in the sign language. But basically, when I was there at the sign, I hadn't studied Zulu much Zulu Osa yet, so I spoke Afrikaans. Yeah, the college brought Afrikaans out. Yeah, I can I can good Afrikaans Afrikaans geleerd for a I I had a conference in in Kapstad gegaan. You know, you know the language I'm speaking now, <laughs> Afrikaans. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but but uh, but do you know this this language that they they say, I I make mean, these like clicks like uh, yeah yeah as I said sounds yeah. sounds I, with with the tongue like yeah 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 of course yeah actually I um I mentioned uh you know I'm writing my autobiography autobiographical memoir and I, I've been translating it into um, oh around 27 languages but with two languages I don't do the translation my tutor does because I don't know the languages well enough to translate and that is Arabic and Zulu and so Zulu is also um, as I say Bantu language that has clicks so look, I play from you a little bit uh, of recorded recording of um, my autobiography in Zulu. Here it is. 
Uta balwani inwenye yekupala. Yeze gikulele mdeni ini unolini ululotwa. E South Florida. Mabeba nengi abakuluma ispanish. Igakulu e Cuba. Yinga ako ulimlo kala enga lifunda kwaba ispanish. So you hear like mm, mm, ah, okay? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the songs have a, a few other clicks. You know, they are different uh, between some of the Bantu language. Most of the Bantu language don't have clicks. Okay, it's mainly in in the southern part, so South Africa, and Namibia, in that in that area, like Mosa and uh, Zulu, and sign language. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard to speak that language when you have a dry mouth. Tampoco sé que es imposible, hombre. No te sale. Pero es, es, es muy curioso ese, ese lenguaje y no sé cómo, cómo, bueno, supongo que es gracias a muchos años de estudio que alguien puede lograr, no sé, traducir, no sé, cómo lograr comunicarse con este pueblo porque a ver entender una palabra con solo clics no no eso no, que no, es yeah, yeah but it's not it's, it, it, yeah but how should I say so it's just minimal pairs in other words words that sound the same but you have a click so it means something different okay so it's not it's not that the click in itself is never meaning it's just part of the word, like moka. You know, that's a long oh, word. Okay, okay. okay. So that's a, a whole word. It just happens to have, and the Q sound is. So it's just in the word itself. Like, okay, so um, what I just, for example, what I just uh, uh, played for you a minute ago at the very the. My the part that says like my story at the be very beginning. Listen. It's slow to word. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it, no, it's actually nice. Nah, the the hard part is getting used to making the clicks. It's much easier to recognize them than it is to recognize some some tones and tonal languages. To differentiate, you know, like in, in Vietnamese, it's such that there are even differences in the region. They have six tones clearly in the north, but only five in the south, um, because a slight difference, you know, between here and here, and so they just drop the difference and make it one in the south. You know, that's more challenging. But also Zulu and San and such they're also tonal languages, but they only have basically three tones, kind of a kind of um, right high and the uh, falling and in the low tone in in the words. But it's a beautiful language. They they, mm. they always it flows so um, the end is of a of a sentence word is has a certain beautiful emphasis to it. Uh, like nah, like uh, the second to last syllable rises always, you know. So it sounds like Italian almost. In that I was gonna say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what what about this this uh, this language? I don't know if I'm, I think it's a dialect or something like that. Uh, they're called Pidgin, for example, like the the one they they speak in Gibraltar, which is a mix of Spanish and uh, British English. Yeah, yeah, there are many there are many pigeons around. I, one in your area is Papimento, right? Yeah, so, in uh, Papimento, you know, uh, Curacao, uh, 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 as well. Yeah, in Curacao and such, and and uh, I had uh, uh, friends from from there. Um, two Dutch girls who grew up there, um, and sometimes uh, they spoke to me in Papimento. Not that I could speak back, but I could understand them. So I just asked them to speak it because uh, it involves only languages that I know. 
<laughs> so uh, you know, heavily, heavily Spanish, Portuguese, Dutch, and then some English all put together. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. And then then you have then you have like talk pisin. You know talk pisin. That's the language of uh, the lingua franca of uh, Papua New Guinea. So pigeon, oh. pisin, pisin, talk pisin. And that's I love that language. Um, they when they count something, they always use the word fella, which is fellow in English. That fellow, of yeah. The, example, right? They say they say one fella. Uh, one, I think, uh, like when you said if, if you were saying that uh, you were you're struck by a, a typhoon, it was like a, 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 I'm getting it wrong. I'm sure, but like a bigger a, a bigger fella, big a bigger fella, giant wind or something like that. Wind, you know, it's. Uh, when they're counting things, they're always throwing in fella or 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 kind of like in, they use like in Indonesian. They have um, like in Indonesian you use yang like orang yang datang the sino orang yang baik or your orang yang you know besar. So the person the person which big you know they use the same kind of constructions and so they can use fella and then a construction like that afterwards to describe it. Yeah. I don't know why what you just well I do know <laughs> you said that the the girls were speaking a language you couldn't speak it but you could understand because it was put together of languages that you know um, I've got I've got two things that that um, brings to mind but the one that I'm really interested in um, I don't know if I've been in a situation to even try this in years um, I've heard of polyglots that are standing in a room and people are speaking in six languages and they're able to just jump in and like add something to different conversations. Hmm. Um, can you do that, or does your brain get stuck in the language you're uh, speaking? Or poly, you poly, polyglot gathering, polyglot conference. Um, I've done more than twenty uh, in a few hours, just kind of when everybody was gathered around and talking. Yeah, yeah, I can um, do. It. I can do it whether I do it well or not. Uh, depends on my emotional energy, uh, other factors, which languages are involved. The hardest thing is to do a monologue. So if you said, okay, now, yeah, you speak more than 30 languages, okay. And so, well, you, you, you threw that at me at the beginning. Yeah, ready, go. You know, int introduce yourself, yeah. these various languages. And okay, I started doing it, but I don't find it easy to do because one, I don't know if it's communication if somebody understands me. And uh, second, I play off the other person and what I'm hearing. It brings me, it brings it back when you, it's priming, uh, you know, priming is involved. That I've experienced. Uh, yeah, you know, when something, a symbol, a word, a sound brings back a memory, it doesn't have to be language, okay? And so the priming brings back the language in me. You know, brings it to the to to the forefront, and then after a while, yeah, I short circuit at times. It's like um, I, I, I've been at a conference, and I remember, okay, I might be speaking in Polish, and Polish is a language which I reached an extremely high level. Okay, so you know, you're European, you're C ones or C twos, because I studied in Polish for two years, and I had the background of our, already Serb Croatian and Russian and Slavic languages, and. Uh, so I had I hadn't been speaking Polish for around thirty years mm. when I first started going to polyglot gatherings, you know, around eight ten years ago, and then, but it came back came back quite quickly, and uh, so I was carrying on a conversation uh, in Polish for around thirty minutes, and we were talking about very a great variety of things, and you know, kind of complex because you know these are polyglots talking about language yeah. and grammar and such, right? And then all of a sudden it. I hit a roadblock. It's like I could no longer feel comfortable trying to express what I wanted to express because I stumbled. And if I stumble, I lose confidence. If I lose confidence, I doubt myself. And Polish it wasn't I, I, or, or grammatically complex. So yeah. So I, I pulled back and I said, okay, I'm switching now. Polish um, is on the list of the of, of the ten most difficult languages that I was looking at yesterday. Uh -huh. Um one one thing I observe of people here, and I, I had a guy I was pr helping practice for the IELTS exam, and I saw him. He, I, I could sense when he was getting tired. I mean, the way he spoke, mm -hmm. and then the way he spoke five minutes later, 
Yeah, I knew it. I knew it. I could. He, he was just getting tired. He was getting sloppy. Yeah. His brain wasn't connecting. Right. It happens to me in any language, including English. English as my mother tongue. I don't always speak it so well, and I talk mm -hmm. about an issue in my autobiography, also in the first part, is that as a child, um, in first grade, we wrote, we read that. Uh, um, we read uh, Tom, Dick, and Jane books. And, but at that age six, I was already reading articles in National Geographic. And so I was bored out of my mind. And if I would sit in class and sleep, or I would, you know, disturb, you know, playing, playing disturb others, playing with things, uh, throwing things, etc. Anyhow, so when I was sleeping, the teacher would sometimes wake me up and say, Tim, wake up. And I would just mumble, huh? what do you want? And so she sent me to a speech therapist. Speech therapy. I mean, for one year, or what was left that year, every day, every, oh, sorry, I think it was once a week. Once a week, I was taken out of class and all the other kids would stare at me. And I had to go into this room where speech therapists held up a picture of an apple and said, apple, apple. That's right. Apple, apple. Did you believe them? I was just, I just, you know, it was. You found course, it amusing, this, I imagine. This is, this is 59 years ago, but yeah. I do have clear memories of a lot of these things. But, okay, so. Why did I mention this? English is the hardest language for me to speak in this sense. Because for many years, that gave me a speech impediment in English. And I don't think I've had much problem in this conversation we're having now. But if you look at my presentations online, you'll find out you'll find times where I do mix up. Like I was doing one about 10 language, languages and I said Vietnamese, not Vietnamese, Vietnamese. And these people, they made comments and laughing at me, you know, I, Vietnamese. And I do that, okay? And so English is the only language where I suffer from that. Okay. And so I think it's, you know, at that young age, being labeled as, you know, somebody with the speech. So you did, you did, you took it on board. You actually did believe it. It became part of you for a while. Yeah. It still is. And it still, still is. It's still, I, I still struggle with it. I have to, even my wife at times, when I get excited, like, uh, I get excited talking about language. And so, you know, on our trips around the world, and somebody else Where's is your wife from? talking about, wait, one second, and, and going da 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 da. <clears throat> she's, she starts going to me like, my wife, she's saying you're not you're not enunciating because I get too excited. Sorry, what'd you say? Where's my wife? Where is she from? Oh, where she's from? She's from here, Itoshima, from 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 Japan. Yeah. Right now, unfortunately, she's in the hospital uh, for three week treatment, and hopefully, it'll work. Uh. Um, but but she she has irritable bowel syndrome, and. She's having to treat it with heavy steroids, so it has to be done. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you experience this that, um, as I'm sitting, like the maids are here today, and if the maid came in and talked to me um, right now, I think I'd be okay talking with her. But if I were speaking Spanish, I'd likely have trouble responding in Bahasa. Um, mm -hmm. I get stuck in a, I get, I get sort of stuck in a language and, um, it's not happening as much now. I've been, I've been practicing Spanish and Portuguese for three years now, but there's times when I know I'm supposed to be speaking a foreign language and like my brain is going to throw me a word in German or in anything but English. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it, it, it happens. I have so much experience with it that I'm pretty good at getting into language and staying with it. I, I do notice um, that when I was speaking, uh, a number of times when I was speaking Bahasa, uh, one of my uh, polyglot friends uh, noticed um, when I, uh, I wanted to say Siddiqui, you know, a little bit, and I said Alicati, 
which is uh, Japanese, Nepali. Oh, okay. Yeah, it, it, it's the you know also Sanskrit language, right? So, okay. Um, yeah, he, he laughed because he he knew what I, he knows some sort of Nepali and he recognized it. He's he's a Malay. Okay. He's a Chinese so, Malay. Yeah. So he recognized right away. Yeah. This is something like my my I had I think I had thirteen years of Spanish and I had eight months of Portuguese. Mm -hmm. um, so I actually don't know when I'm speaking Portuguese. I just I just go and I don't know how much of it's Spanish and how much of it's actually Portuguese. Um, uh, no, I don't. I, I don't follow Portuguese. No, I don't. I, I, don't, I don't mix. I do. <laughs> I no. do. No. Yeah, if you're learning it, of course you 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 do it when you start off. Okay, when I was studying in Bogota, yeah, when we didn't know a word, we bought it from Spanish and used Brazilian pronunciation. You know, because and it works at times because, like, if you there's a spell the same way, like gente is gente, right? So sometimes the same word just pronounced differently. Yeah. Uh, so, but um, no, it, I, I love Brazilian Portuguese too much. It's in it's in my soul. Um, I've only spent about three and a half months in Brazil uh, throughout my life. Uh, the first one was the biggest influence was in nineteen um, seventy six. Then again, nineteen eighty four, and uh, but I read all the works of Jorge Amado. Mm. And I've listened to thousands and thousands of hours of of uh, uh, so música popular brasileira, so popular Brazilian music. It's it's not just simple pop; it's it's music of the times. Um, and uh, yeah, so it it feels differently. And, and even when I speak Spanish, I you know I speak in different ways. So I'm basically cubano colombiano, but I also uh, for a while. Uh, Worked on imitating Porteño, you know, and that's totally different. Uh, Buenos Aires. Yeah, Buenos Aires. Oh, ah. con usted, hola, conmigo, con okay. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, um, there are various languages which I have various dialects in my head. German is one because I learned German first in, in Colombia, so study, but I used it in Switzerland. I used it working. Uh, in southern Germany and, and, and most of all near Nuremberg, so Frankish. So when I usually, I can push myself to sound like more Hochdeutsch and normal, but usually when I, uh, I speak Deutsch with then Schweizer or Frankish, the Aussprache is better for me. I glaube it's schön, ja, schön. Ja. So I speak like that instead of like, yeah, ja, ich glaube das, you know, it's I don't, the hard part. Because the, that germ is beautiful for me, why Hochdeutsch is uh, not so pleasing to my ears, you know. Yeah. So yeah, the various various accent, on, and in Japanese, I speak it to its standard and our local dialect and things like that. Yeah. So. Now, Hungerman, yeah. Irbenso Hungerman, chogun kombo heseo. Eh, teo ke so, uri, uri teo ke so, eh, hang, hangu hakseng mai yo. You understand? I said there are many uh, Korean students here. I studied it here. Um, I even gave a speech in Korean a long time ago at a wedding of one of my students. Um, but Korean, Korean is, uh, of, of all the Asian languages I know, it's one I get into and I and I get out of. So in order to speak it well, I I need to concentrate on it for a little while to bring it all back. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. But, uh, is somebody there with you? Why are you wearing a mask? Oh, really? Okay. No, it's just that I, I read lips, okay? My hearing is... So, um, it's okay. I have the volume up. But if we're in person, the trouble, I can't, I can't teach classes very well. 
uh, when students are in a distance. You know, it's it's part of my also uh, my age. It's funny I'm so into language, but I've always had a slight hearing problem. About eighty percent normal, so it's not that bad. But now that I'm in my mid sixties, I don't hear high voice as well. <laughs> ah, okay, okay. Bagus. Tidak ada apa. Okay. Hmm. Uh -huh. so, uh, yeah, but, uh, yeah, but that that's an irregular verb, Hada. So, yeah, 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 it's an irregular verb, so it, it conjugates differently, just like in Japanese, suru. And so, suru, shimasu, shimashita, the change. So, Hada, he, he, becomes he, yeah. mm. shio, <laughs> uh, shio, let's do. Yeah. Right, right, right. Exactly. Exactly. That's the end. Yeah. yeah. Japanese and Korean are 90% similar in syntax, the way they function. Yeah. I, um, I, I can't put exact time on it because I, I, would study some beginning beginning about close to 38 years ago i guess maybe 39 years ago i'd study some, then i'd stop i went to korea a number of times uh so i studied before i go um and then as i mentioned uh, i gave a speech at a wedding that was i think 14 years ago and i study intensely at least 500 hours uh 14 years ago but then i have i don't use it that much so and i don't tend to listen to a lot of korean even though it's all around me and it's easy of course on the internet um so if i mean i've been there even recently so once i'm there then i then i can communicate and, and and get by but um it doesn't come out as easy as many other languages i mean yeah, it's just i haven't used this much Indonesian, Malay, I've used a lot, you know, as I told you, I've been there in the area more than 20 times. Thai, for example, or Chinese, I still use all the time. So, uh, you know, it's quite different. But in, in, in European languages tend to stay with me well, uh, but, you know, they... Huh? What's that? Uh, jeg snakker norsk, jeg kan uh, svensk, og den stans forstår det mer. Uh, jeg heter et litt svensk uh, studiet. Jeg har bare lært litt av svensk, men jeg snakker norsk. Jeg lærte norsk, lærte norsk i, i Polen. Det var en mann fra uh, Bergen som underviste norsk i universitetet min. Og uh, så jeg studied uh, for uh, two years, you know, a couple of times a week, and then I've been to Norway a few times. But also, in order to speak, Norwegian is fairly easy to get back into. I need to read a book or something in order to, to bring it back. The, the hardest, the most challenging one are Slavic languages because, um, because they are so similar, you know. And, 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 and so it's hard to stay in one language. Uh, it, it, I don't have no problem. With, uh, no problem with Russian and Polish. Uh, in general, Serbo Croatian, I switch between a more Croatian type to a more Serbian type. You know, which Irene understands what I mean. It's like different. It, there's different uh, the way the words change. To some words itself, like "lekom lekom lieko," the ye ye dialect, and so depending, like oh, you say the river would be either in Serbian "reka" or some parts of Serbia still "rieka." or in Croatia, Rijeka, and things like that. And then um, <clears throat> also the way that you construct sentences, Serbs, especially those close to uh, Bulgaria, such they almost always split, don't use infinitive as much. And so um, 
So instead of saying, uh, like, volume it, I want it mean to go, they say volume da idem. You conjugate those verbs, which is required in Greek, in Romanian, Albanian, um, because they don't use infinitives. Are, are you aware of that? That, that how, how languages can work like that? You have to when you like in English. I want to go, or I I I couldn't. I don't. I I can't speak even. Okay. Pogodagavorim is very Serbian. I can that I speak. I I cannot that I can that I speak. Okay, it's the way that you say it. In in Greek, then boro na milau. Then boro is the conjugation. I cannot, and then milau is I speak. I cannot that I speak. So they function the same way. So it's harder to, uh, if I'm aware of it, usually I can I can stay with it and fine. But you can, uh, you know, the first time I heard a Slovak, Pebi Krat kids to all some, to all kohos is Slovaki, Chavorit is Slovensko. Rozumel som velmi dobre. First time I heard somebody speak Slovak, I understood very well, but I couldn't say what I just said because I now said it in Slovak. But I understood what they said in Slovak, so I answered them back in Polish and mixed between Polish and Serbo-Croatian because they it's similar to both languages. Like the past tense is done the same way as in Serbo, uh, in in um, Serbo-Croatian. Polish past tense is different. Like "stałem" um, I read, but in uh, those southern languages "stają" sam sem som depends on som som I. It's a word. It's a word, it's a conjugation of verb to be. I am. You are. We are. We are. Etc. They are. Right. And you put that with the past participle, and it goes either before or after, depending on the sentence. And Polish functions differently. Russian, uh, Russian uh, drops that all together and just says ya, ya stal, Okay. Ya bil. We don't need to use that. Okay. So they there are these characteristics and grammar and such that it's. You have to get used to, and then sometimes easy to stay within using those characteristics, and sometimes not. And then also, you have so many false cognates between the languages. Like uh, it just if if you said if you said uh, in in Polish uh, you said "szukasz uh, mieszkanie," that means are you looking for apartment. In Slovak, I cannot mention what that means. First, it means I am late, and then shukanye is the F word, okay? <laughs> so they are totally false cognates <laughs> between the language that you have to watch out for, like zahud is, and then it means toilet in another one, okay? So there's hundreds and hundreds of examples. You even have a lot of false cognates between Malay and Indonesian, yeah? In the various parts of Malay, Indonesia, many, yeah, like, yeah. So, uh, well, just word like when you say Indonesia, always say bisa, yeah, bisa. And in Indonesia, bisa, bisa can mean poison. It can mean poison, but in Malay, it only means poison. <laughs> in, in 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 I can right, uh, but when they say boleh in Malay, they mean I can. But the Indonesian means it. The Indonesian means I may, right? Bolit pergi? Can I go? May I go? Right? Not can I go? Right? Yeah. So who are, okay, who else we have here? I see. I see various people haven't spoken. So, uh, for example, uh, Olivia Fernandez Antoni from Philippines. Uh, yeah. no, 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 not with a name like that, Philippine. <laughs> <laughs> no. No. I am I am a Spanish native speaker. Ah sí, yo yo creía que quizá Filipina, porque <laughs> de dónde eres, Ma Oliva. Hey, team, hello. <laughs> Guys, Say the Peru. Guys, sorry to interrupt. I got a question. Uh -huh. This is a simple question, but a bit important. Okay, let's say apart from any languages that we have, let's say it's just English. 
Well, I've been learning English since I was in Seno High School and till university. And then uh, there is a friend of mine who study the same. We have the same background. But whenever I speak English, they said, not me, but they said I have this accent. I mean, like mixed American and British. While my friend here, she got like a very high score in anything like reading, writing, speaking, and whatever it is. But the way she speaks is not like like me. She still has this this Japanese accent. So, do you think um, having this accent kind of gift, or uh, because of I'm I'm like uh, practicing much? Because we we honestly we are practicing every day together. But the result is different. What do you think about that? From well, team first of all, the amount of time of exposure is not uh, is not so critical. There's a certain uh, there's a certain mass, a certain point that you reach where you've had enough input where you can uh, it's pot potentially um, speak the language with the uh, accent that you target, that you desire, with the prosody that you desire. Um, so the rest is just uh, uh, mainly issues with uh, linguistic identity and cultural identity and how how your ego. I, I wrote re if you can read the paper that I that I um, wrote in his, in uh, in the academic edu page. Uh, I talk about it a lot, but I mean, you can, a simple example is Henry Kissinger. Do you know who Henry Kissinger was or is? He he was uh, from German descent, but he lived most of his life in the U.S., but he spoke like a German, very strong German, speaking English. That was his choice, okay? Uh, but you got other people who are exposed to language just a short time and can uh, change to the the accent and, and not just accent, prosody. You understand what prosody? Prosody is the rhythm of the language, it includes the pronunciation, etc., and the intonation. So it's just uh, some people are open to it, some people are not. Uh, yeah. Like Tim, the other Tim here, he says he's not into it so much. He doesn't uh, feel. Uh, I don't know. You don't feel I like sounded I sounded pretty pretty horrible in Spanish until I got to southern Spain and skipped the university for a week. And a guy from uh, uh, he was Basque. <clears throat> he started imitating me without. He wasn't making fun <laughs> of me. He wasn't exaggerating. Uh, I couldn't I couldn't hear my own mistakes. It's it's like it's like the exercise I tell people now. Record yourself. Yeah. Let it sit for an hour and then listen to it. It's like you're hearing a different person. Yeah. Yeah. When when he when I heard the stuff coming out of his mouth, I'm like, ah, it's horrible. You know, we we influence each other. It influence each other. It's a chameleon effect, you know. We so we automatically imitate. That's how we we all creatures learn that way. Yeah, it's not the only way you learn, but it's the main way that you learn. Well, you know what? We kind of having these same methods, like. We're recording our voices and we try to practice it every day, especially the pronunciation. It's still different. I don't know why. And somehow... Yeah, in place, it depends on your own yeah. conscious or subconscious choice you're making. Oh. How, are you going to imitate or not? All of us are naturally born imitators, you know? Okay, because we all have a certain accent and it came from somewhere. So we've done it once in life. But not only that, uh, even gender, okay? So nowadays there's, you know, a lot of discussion about gender identity, which brings us to the forefront. So where, when do females and how do females begin to act like females and males like males? Well, from certain role models, you can see even a little baby, uh, a female, walking with a swinging rear you know, imitating the mother. There's nothing physiologi physiologically to cause that. A woman can walk as straight as a man without wiggling, you know, the hips. That is, that is totally, well, 
it's not totally it's 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 it's, it's some i'd say there's there is some genetic aspects involved in it, just like you know birds act a certain way as a mating call and etc okay but so much of this influenced by our imitating so uh you can so if you look at this issues with gender identity now so people take on a different way of acting to fit how, how they perceive themselves right what is you going to do the same with language and the, the accent you choose etc when when i speak english sometimes my accent goes all over the place i've done well here i haven't heard a lot of different accents but it, it happens to be more in person i much more in person i imitate okay so <clears throat> i guess the easiest one is to talk about the subcontinent because we see that many foreigners in in for example india uh, they start imitating the body language and also the rhythm of speech and i remember meeting one girl uh, it was in our jeep my wife and i were going up uh, into uh dar um Dar and she had been in india for about uh, eight months she couldn't really speak much hindi at all but when she spoke she started doing this and no really i mean her whole process of intonation and the way the speed that she spoke sometimes she spoke very quickly in english and sometimes <laughs> and you know and it was very clear that english was the only language she really knew but she started to mold her english to fit more with what she was hearing around her and the way she, she stressed things and expressed things and spoke was strongly influenced by the last eight months of her life. And you could, it, it, even if she didn't say anything, when you ask what you want to do this, she would give you the nod of the head like that. So she was open to it and she...